waste. Out of sight, out of mind, right? If you thought yes, I regret to inform you that you are quite wrong. The waste problem in the United States has actually more than quadrupled in the past 50 years. In fact, the United States produced more garbage than any other country in 2016, only about 30% of which was actually recycled. Globally, humans produce around 2.6 trillion pounds of garbage every year, and while some of the garbage is biodegradable, a large portion of it is made up of plastic which lasts virtually forever. This is what makes single-use plastic so profoundly flawed. They are created from a material made to last forever, but are designed to be used once and thrown away. In 1999, volunteers skimming only 7,500 miles of ocean counted approximately 1 million pieces of garbage floating in the ocean per square mile. When you do something on 444 miles of, of tributary, you begin to see what litter really plagues the areas, and plastic is the worst. A later study revealed about 5.2 trillion pieces of plastic scattered about the world's oceans about 700 pieces for every person in the world. So how do we combat this overwhelming problem? Is the answer as simple as the three R's? Plastic, in general, is made from a mixture called resin, which is made from petroleum, oil, or natural gas. The most common plastics are the six that were assigned codes in 1988 by the Society of the Plastics Industry, Inc. These codes help recycling facilities to keep like resins together to avoid the mixing of different chemicals. Once these plastics are separated and sent to a recycling facility, they are either processed into pellets for further recycling or incinerated. There is a lot of controversy surrounding the incineration of plastics, mainly because there is not a largely understood distinction between incinerators and places that burn trash. Proper incineration takes place in a closed environment with a controlled supply of oxygen, not just a building with fire in a smokestack. The products being incinerated go through a complicated process to remove any acidic gases or vapors, so hardly anything escapes from a well-managed incinerator. Plastics, like PET and HEPE, are common in food packaging and are easily recycled or incinerated. Other plastics, like PVC and plastics that contain cadmium, are difficult to recycle or incinerate because of the harmful impact they can have on humans and recycling machines alike. PVC, when too hot, produces hydrochloric acid which can destroy recycling machines, and plastics containing cadmium, a toxic metal, can be dangerous to both machines and humans. Even just a few pieces of these plastics in a large batch can destroy a recycling machine, creating even more waste. This is why the sorting of these plastics is such a vital part of the recycling process. Sure, we can recycle plastics like PET and HEPE all we want, but sooner or later they will end up in a landfill or the ocean. Let's also think about just how plastics are recycled. People put their plastic into a plastic box where it is picked up by a vehicle that runs on oil, which is a key ingredient in plastic. These blue box collection systems end up losing more money than they are making by recycling, and it seems that we are only adding to the problem by producing more plastic. The book Eco Facts and Eco Fiction even refers to the curbside collection system as an environmental insult involving the absolute minimum effort of the public. There is also the fact that the expense of recycling far outweighs the profit it brings in, with the energy wasted by the transportation, collection, and sorting of these plastics. So shouldn't we get rid of the problem, or at least stop it before it gets worse? With recycling and incinerating some plastics posing a danger to our health, why not just ban plastic production? The answer is simple. It will only drive consumers to the next available resource, possibly one even worse than plastic. Study after study, including one conducted recently by the California Water Board, has shown that banning a plastic product simply drives consumers to other less sustainable materials. Bans have a very minor impact on litter, if they have any impact at all. So we stop recycling altogether. The waste still piles up even more rapidly than before. Landfills spill into the ocean, contaminating not only waterways, but other organisms, habitats, and ultimately, our food. An Australian study in 2015 found that 90% of 186 species of seabirds had some traces of plastic in their system. Denise Hardesty, a researcher in this study, reported that in these birds she has found everything from cigarettes to model cars. Plastic has been consumed by an estimated 90% of seabird species and eaten by every species of sea turtles. Even our corals are threatened. Fish are also victim to plastic poisoning, sometimes ingesting polymers that have absorbed PCBs, pesticides, and other harmful chemicals. These chemicals can in turn cause the growth of tumors and liver problems in whoever eats these contaminated fish. In addition to polluting the marine environment, plastic poses a risk to human health. We're now seeing plastic in our water, our food, soil, air, and bodies. Plastic particles have been found in everything from honey and beer to salt and tea. So what do we do with all of it? One direction we could go is cleaning up the oceans and reusing the already millions of pounds of plastic produced floating around uselessly in the ocean. 
This way, we aren't putting more plastic into the system and are only recycling what is already available. This would take and keep plastic out of the ocean since we would now rely on the reuse of this material, not the initial creation. Another route we could go includes the continuation of plastic production, but on a smaller scale. Plastic companies could focus on finding a new and safer material that could easily be reused while also educating people on how to recycle properly and why it's important. Our industry agrees with everyone in this room that there is a plastic waste problem. The urgency of the situation cries out for a solution more thoughtful than simply say no to a material that lowers greenhouse gas emissions, is more efficient to produce than other materials like metal, paper, and glass, and has delivered numerous benefits to society as a whole. Plastic has only become an essential part of our lives because we have allowed it to be. If we change our focus to education on recycling and even finding a cleaner alternative, then that too will become a necessary part of our lives. Either way, a wide-scale cleanup is far overdue. Plastic pollution has been something that has been tossed aside for future generations to deal with for too long. I think now is the time we finally tackle this problem, and we can only do so if everyone is in it together. After all, humans cause the plastic problem, and humans can solve it.